will not forget you. We will continue to work with you, and we need the world to work with us. I think we do. Oh, all right. There you Here go. We go. <laughs> so, uh, this is Earthwind Cousin, and I think she's the Jeff Bezos of humanitarian, <laughs> the humanitarian world, because she, I don't know if you know this, this woman has a fleet of planes, helicopters, <laughs> trucks, and she has a supply chain, and 14,000 people work for yes. this organization that is actually bigger than Amazon. So we need to salute this woman for all kinds of heroism. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I'm seeing women way up there. Can you see her shoes? <laughs> I said there's some benefits to living in Rome. <laughs> so can we start uh, just by you giving us a brief overview of the situation in the world today in terms of starvation, mal malnutrition. Where are the worst spots? How bad is it? Sure, there's 759 million people who are food insecure as we sit here today, who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. There's 60 million refugees and internally displaced people, more people living outside their homes than since World War II. 80% of the people that WFP feeds or supports through food assistance programs live in marginal, vulnerable places. And I say they're tough people living in vulnerable places. And of that 80%, 93% of all of the people who live in poverty live in conflict-affected places or climate-affected places around the world. So we're in a situation where um, the challenges have never been greater in modern times. Well, I think of the war zones mm -hmm. where people are fleeing, obviously, Syria, Iraq, Yemen. Yeah. I wonder how you get food to those people. It must be incredibly dangerous for your workers. In fact, the yeah, that's the, I, I, I work with 14,000 of the bravest, hardest working people in the world. And when you go into Syria or Yemen or South Sudan, there are WFP people there working. Many of them are uh, they're nationals of that country who don't flee because they know if they leave, then their neighbors won't have food, their country won't have food, so they stay. In some places, we're forced to airdrop food. Uh, and that's uh, the worst way of getting food to people because you can't target exactly who you need the food to go to. And but the if bad it, guys can go in and, and well, take it. Well, we are, the, the, the good thing about it is this is 2016 and GPS systems and guided parachutes and all kinds of technology allows us to work with people who are in those besieged areas to ensure that if we're forced to airdrop that we can get the food right into the area where the people are located without it getting to the bad guys. And so we, uh, uh, much of what we do today uh, is supported by technology. But you've had your workers kidnapped, you've had them killed, you've had them attacked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this is the, mm -hmm. what you're up to, at least in the Middle East and, and Northern Africa, right. is as treacherous, as, as treacherous a situation for humanitarian workers as we've seen. Uh, and, and yet, these people are still going in there. You're telling us. Well, it's not just in the Middle East. In South Sudan last year, I lost five people. One of them was actually taken off an airplane by the bad guys because they suspected one of our employees of working for the other side, and we never saw him again. Um, the, I, I have had staff kidnapped where the toughest phone call to make is to call a daughter to tell her that we haven't gotten her father back. Uh. Um, but humanitarians don't sign up to give their lives, but they know that they, the risks that they're taking, and they're willing to take those risks in order to ensure that we can provide support to people who otherwise wouldn't have food to eat. 
Now, you, you just told me a story backstage that is breathtaking. You received less money last year, mm -hmm. or a couple of years ago, whenever, you tell the story, mm -hmm. and, and people are beginning to think that that, in a way, created the whole flood of refugees out of Syria, Iraq, and so forth, and Angela Merkel and you had a conversation about this, so tell the whole story. Well, the, in, the Syrian war has now been going on for more than five years. And the first year of the war, we were receiving the resources that we needed. We started feeding 250,000 people inside Syria in 2012. We quickly moved to a million. Now we're feeding four million people inside Syria and another two and a half million people outside Syria. Over in 2015, 2014 and 2015, while donor generosity was exceptional, the needs continued to increase. And so we were forced to cut the amount of food that we provide. And outside Syria, we actually provide a, a cash transfer so that people can shop in grocery stores in Jordan and Lebanon and maintain their dignity even when they've lost everything else. But we were forced to cut. We were forced to cut some people completely off and others down to a very marginal amount. And I would not say, but many who have studied this situation have suggested that when we cut those benefits was when people started moving, that it was a significant factor because people lost hope that things were going to get better. And so they started to they look were for hungry, other opportunities. I'm sure, on top looking of for it. other opportunities. And so there was a pledging conference in London. And this is woman power. I walk into a room where I'm scheduled to have a meeting with Angela Merkel, and it's, it's scheduled as a photo op. And her people say to me, Miss Cousins, she has a very short period of time, stand over in the corner, and she'll take a picture with you, and then you'll need to move on very quickly. And I say, OK. Um, she comes in the room, and she says, hello, very seriously. And she says, come with me. Sit down. We need to talk. And her people are looking as if, oh my God, we can't control the situation, but she's in charge. And she has a piece of paper in her hand that has our budget for the entire Syria uh, food assistance program, both for inside and outside Syria. And she says, this is how much money you need. This is how much you've raised. I'm giving you $700 million. And I'm going to make sure that you get the rest of what you need. Stunning. Stunning. She said, it must be really hard going around begging all the time. I said, it is my life, but then I have people like you who respond. And so it was well, amazing. Listen, she is the one who's suffering because the people are leaving their homes. And because they're hungry, uh, because they're hungry, they're fleeing, partly. Maybe it's not the only reason, but right. it's a big reason. It's big. She got it. She got it. It's and hurting she her. has taken political risk by saying that Germany will accept. Exactly, exactly. It, it's been, she doesn't want not to have only, to say two million people. Correct. She's not only opening the doors of Germany, but she's providing the support so that people don't feel the need to move. Stunning. So obviously everybody knows of the problems in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, but there are other places in the world where people are suffering because they don't have enough food. What, what are the other major parts of the world where you're worried that they're not being fed well, WFP works in 80 countries around the world. We feed approximately 80 million people in those 80 countries around the world. And uh, too often, it's the places like Syria that receive the attention. And, but what I always say is that we cannot, as a global community, prioritize one hungry child over another. Merely because you don't see the stories on the 10 o'clock news or even on 60 Minutes, we need to make sure that we are bringing attention to those, to those bringing, and bringing support to those who need it. For example, I was just in Nigeria. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, we all carried sign, bring back our girls. You remember that. Oh, yeah. uh, but now, the world's not paying attention. And Boko Haram has actually killed more people than have been killed in Syria. Markets are no longer operating in northern Nigeria because suicide bombers, many of the girls who have, come, who have found their way back, have only gotten back because they have been used as suicide bombers in markets. 
And so those who come back safely, their, parent, their families don't trust them. But more importantly, brokers don't go there and food doesn't come in. And so we're seeing people who have been terrorized by Boko Haram, who now are looking to the global community for food assistance because they can't feed themselves. And these are people who were working before. They were farmers before. The girls were in school before. I talked to men who told me they were fishermen, that they worked in markets, that they were business people. Now they're doing nothing because they can't move for fear and they're depending on us to, to provide food assistance. And so we see them, them, they've moved to Chad, Cameroon, as well as in Nigeria. Uh, to me, this is another war zone. What about Latin America? Yeah. I mean, you were El just Nino. backstage talking about countries right close to us, Guatemala. Yes. Uh, when we talk about climate change, climate change is affecting, as I said, marginal people across the world. Uh, but this year, we have the, 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 the largest El Nino in history. El Ninos are periodic weather uh, patterns that affect and they create droughts. Um, but this year, it's because of, and some would say because of, of climate change, the, this is a, the, a greater El Nino than ever before. Again, affecting East Africa, Ethiopia, uh, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Malawi, but also, and then untalked about, Latin America, Guatemala, Honduras, um, as well as El Salvador, and are all being affected by El Nino. And the challenge is that climate change forced, created a drought for the last three years in Central America. Now we're in a fourth year of drought that is dri driven by El Nino. And in Guatemala alone, we have assessed that 900,000 people who are either moderately or severely, suffering from moderate or severe, uh, hunger. And so our challenge is working with both the government and donors to provide enough food assistance and to provide support to people so that they can continue to try and feed themselves. Because again, these are populations who don't want to stand in line. They ask for us for help until they can help themselves again. And so I was down there to bring attention to a situation that is now being completely ignored. And I'll leave from here, and next week I'm in Haiti, because we remember Haiti from the earthquake. We know that many of the families still haven't overcome the challenges that the, earth, the earthquake created there, and now they're facing a drought there that is El Nino related as well. Wow. It's mammoth, the whole wor world food situation is mammoth and getting more critical. I'm gonna ask you some more questions about that, but I'm, I'm interested in you okay. and how you got this great job. You grew up in Chicago, mm -hmm. you're a lawyer, mm -hmm. single mother. Yes. Single mother. Yes. Now, isn't it true? <laughs> Most of my life. Um, now, what I love, because I'm, I'm about to plug my new book, <laughs> what I love, my new book is called Becoming Grandma, it's a little tacky of me, but here it is. <laughs> Earthwind told me that uh, her, her mother came and helped her so that she could have her career. Well, not only did my mother help me, my, my sisters helped me. I think my niece is someplace out there. Uh, her mom helped me. Um, my sister often says my son was raised by group. Um, because we all work together to raise him, and now um, he has children of his own, and I So can, you're a grandmother. I'm a grandma, and <laughs> yes. love, no, wait, 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 wait. Grandma I, power. No, 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 I am not a grandma. I am a Gigi. <laughs> and that's what they call me. Well, I'm a lolly. Oh, uh, there you there go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't being a grandmother better than being a mother? Oh, <laughs> leaps and bounds. It is so much fun I'm because you get you. to give them back. You give them chocolate, you get, you get them hyper, and then you hand them back to their parents. It's a wonderful thing. And you know what? Your kids don't have any idea where that came from. And they say, who are you? Right, Body exactly. Snatches. And exactly. your answer is, I have no idea. Right. Where, where, where did this <laughs> loving, incredible loving come from? 
great, right? You've never loved like this before. Completely. I know. I, 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 you. I say all the time, I say, first of all, my grandson it doesn't get, he, he has actually attended all these kinds of events with me, just as his, his dad did when he was growing up. But um, well, I'm Gigi, you know, okay, you may be feeding 80 million people a year, yeah, people like you, but hey, Gigi, you know, could you tie my shoe, please? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. And you say and anything I say, you want. Yes, dear. <laughs> and I do just that. It's the best thing that can happen. People tell you, but you don't understand the depths of it until it happens to you. Yes, that is absolutely true. But Earthrun, Gigi, <laughs> we're here to talk about food. So okay. let's get back to the situation. Would you say that the situation regarding starving, malnutrition, hunger, is as critical as it's ever been in our lifetimes right now? Oh, definitely. By Without a doubt. Bounds. Without a doubt. I mean, we have a situation where acute hunger, the kind of hunger that people think about that comes from drought and, and uh, floods and natural disasters and conflict, is affecting and creating uh, pockets of hunger. But then what we have that we haven't had in modern history are these protracted crises this protracted crisis of, of, because of refugee displacement and the 60 million people who are, as I said, internally displaced inside their own countries or living, in the, taking refuge in a, in a third country uh, or a second country, those people can't work in most cases. They don't have access to land. They don't have access to resources. And uh, the, the, the generosity of the international community is, is, is strained, and we are, because of terrorism now, more reluctant about accepting refugees. And we forget that refugees helped build America and Europe. We're afraid. You know what? You know what? I'm, I'm watching this clock. Okay. And I want to end on a question about what we can do. We're listening to you. I know we're all having emotions and are, are developing new concerns. Mm -hmm. So what can a person do? What can an American do to help you? Well, first of all, let me say thank you to all of you who are Americans here, because the U.S. is the most generous country on earth. No matter what you think about our politics, um, our budget, a, a significant portion of our budget is provided by the U.S. government. And our largest private sector contributions are received from, um, from private sector companies here and from individuals here. And we have an app now that um, you can go on, and it's called Share the Meal, those of you who have iPhones, or any kind of, 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 uh, in, of access to apps. Watch the clock. Uh, access to apps, and you can actually give and buy school meals. 500,000 people around the world have given meals to uh, children in places like Lebanon. You can help do that, but you can also help by ensuring that leaders know that you care and these issues are important, and you want the generosity of the world to continue, particularly here in the United States. Is she not fabulous? Thank you fabulous. all very much. Fabulous. Thank you. Fantastic.